Hi there, Amanda Creel. It's Hi. been a while since I've talked to you, actually. Yeah, it's been a little bit. Yeah, three years. So I wanted to just start off our video together, just to say the whole reason why I reached out to you. Um, and then I listened to our last uh, video that we made together. And that was because you um, had sent a video on Instagram, I think it was, or Facebook. And I have it linked below because I thought it was really inspiring and and just sweet and also hopeful. So I wanted to kind of start out our interview today, our podcast today with the whole idea about being hopeful and finding people who give you that message or give you that inspiration. And I feel like you're, that's kind of your, your motto, right? It feels like you give people a lot of hope and kind of pull the goodness out of them. But what I saw was um, that you and your ex-husband, I guess we could say is um, we're able to talk about how the relationship didn't work and being really hopeful about this new relationship that was starting to be created between you two. And so, and one of the places that I work on with people is how they get hopeful about relationships going forward. Maybe not the ones they're coming from, because maybe they don't have the skills that or the other person doesn't have the capacity to, to give, to work on that with them, but to have hope for themselves. And and the other point that I wanted to, to talk about or have you talk about is that sometimes we go on in long-term relationships and we know something isn't right and we keep trying to work it out and we yeah. keep trying to like figure out if we can, maybe if we do this or maybe if we do that, or maybe if we both agree on, on these five things that the relationship can stay in place. So I wanted you to talk about those two burning things that I have questions about with you, which is how did you give yourself hope once you got to the decision of leaving the relationship? And then also what was it about the relationship that you kept trying to figure out if you could make it work? And what was the, the, the thing that wasn't working? You don't have to be that personal disclosure if you don't want to, but when you said, okay, it's just not going to work no matter what we try, how we try to puzzle this out. So those are the two burning questions I had for you after watching that video. Well, where to start? I guess, so we were married for 25 years and it was, I don't want to say miserable because it wasn't miserable. We had good moments throughout, uh, but he definitely had some narcissistic tendencies. I don't think he's a full narcissist. I think that he just has a lot of those tendencies because of some from family things, you know, from growing up and whatnot. Um, and it, so everything was always about him all the time. There was me and three kids and him in this whole relationship, but it was, everything had to be catered to him all the time. I really feel like I, and he will say this is true at this point that I raised the kids by myself. You know, I was married, but I was really a single parent and it was hard. It was really, really, really hard. And I knew 15, maybe 20 years ago that it was never going to work. But by that point we had the kids together and I didn't know how to extract myself without mm -hmm. making their lives miserable. I really, and now, now looking at it now with them being all older, it was, it was easier to do it the way we did it now. Um, if I had left when they were much younger, I was terrified that he would uh, try to take the kids from me. He would, you know, and, and he probably would have, whether he wanted to parent them alone or not, or, you know, have sole custody, he would have taken them just to hurt me. And he had the money to do it. And I didn't have the money to fight it. So all of these reasons, I stayed longer than I should have. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I had, I honestly had no hope when things broke down last year that we would have any kind of relationship. I was super committed to mm -hmm. being kind to him no matter what, because I feel like, you know, well, not just, I feel like we are tied together for right. the rest of our lives because mm -hmm. of our three kids. Um, right. And I that right from you know from things breaking down um I feel like I made a lot of efforts through the years and he'll say that is accurate too uh, we've been going to couples counseling for months and he even says to our therapist you know like she definitely was trying I was not like I was bitter I was angry he felt like I my independence was an affront to him just like we had all kinds of issues so many issues um, that it's just impossible to even describe all of them. But like I said, yeah, so I, I want to slow you down for one second. Cause you're made, you just made really four really great points. And I just want <laughs> the people who are listening to this, to hear the points. One was the whole idea about timing that 
you actually looked at the timing of what was going to work for your family and when, and that you weren't going to be impulsive. You kind of knew, okay, I'm kind of always climbing this mountain. I can't seem to not climb this mountain this hard. It's, and I am working on it and I'm trying to, I'm making tons of efforts and I'm in what a lot of people say the best interest of the kid kids, but part of it was the interest of you raising the family and knowing that like you both had very different, um, uh, angles on the family and your angle was like, you know, kid focus, emotional focus of the kids. And I love that, that he also, um, it sounds like, you know, he be, he, he, part of him is a really reasonable person that he saw that, um, that you both just thought really differently about life and about marriage and family. So, um, but he saw all the efforts you were making and would agree that, um, that he wasn't going to collaborate with you in these in these points the way you saw it and your independence was threatening so i just want want people to hear that, that there is timing there is best interest of the kids there yeah. is really facing the limitations of the relationship and also facing the the real style differences in relationship that often break it up like you have to face those things if you can't negotiate those things you have to face them yeah absolutely and prior to everything breaking down, which was April 10th of last year, uh, 2022. So it's been just over a year since everything kind of just like completely blew up. And um, I, he was very, very hurt. Things got a little crazy for a while. We weren't, we didn't speak to each other for almost three weeks. And then um, we randomly met. (laughs) I went to fill up water jugs and he happened to drive by at the same time. And I was under the impression that there was no hope. Like I said earlier, like we were not going to be able to work things out. I was committed to being kind to him no matter what, but I didn't expect the same back from him. And then we met each other on the road that day. And he was just like, don't file for divorce. You know, don't, we don't have to do this mean. I, I promise I'll be nice. And I'm super skeptical because, you know, over the years he has been able to, pull himself back and act better, I guess, um, when I would put my foot down and say, I'm leaving if this, if this behavior doesn't stop, um, mm-hmm. and he could stop for a while, but it was never something he could maintain for mm-hmm. long periods of time. So mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, I hear you and I'm going to be nice. And if we can, you know, just have a, a civil discourse here, then maybe we can work things out and everything can be better. Um, but I was still pretty committed to the divorce. Um, it was not like, I'll get to that. But so really the the best thing that has happened here and something that I never expected was that he is able to recognize the behaviors that he was doing throughout our marriage and actively work on changing them. And I think a lot of that is due to our therapist, but a lot of it is also because like I said, I don't think he's a full narcissist. I think he just had those tendencies and this awful, terrible thing happening to him was enough to like shock him into realizing like, yeah, I've really been a a terrible husband and father and I have to do something to fix this. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. It's and so there's awesome. some good points in that too. I want to just um, talk about is that it's so common and, and I really want people to hear this, that there, it's so, so common that there's a breakdown and people just like, I can't do this anymore. And then it's a, a little bit of a mess. It's like a chaotic mess for a while because people are really, both parties are really like thrown off by it. And, and then there's regular life and kids and things that you got to do. And then there was, um, I love that motto that you had, like, I'm always going to come at this being kind and then coming back and just talking and looking at, um, recognizing like both parties sometimes and maybe you're reckon, recognizing this was like more like how you maybe kept overstepping your your judgment but that um recognizing what's the behavior that's not working and and realizing you have to change it because there is a relationship that you can have after the couple relationship ends which is the parenting relationship so yeah. you have to recognize that there's something in both parties that has to really change and I, and I see, hear that pattern and see that a lot is that there's a, uh, somebody having tendencies of narcissism or other um, mental health issues or concerns or addictions. And then the other pretty 
party puts their foot down and they're like, okay, okay, I'm going to change. But it's not a permanent change. It's a reactive change just to kind of get the peace back. And then the behavior continues. But there is this whole other relationship that can be developed, which the kids need, which is two parents working together um, going forward. So I'm really, I'm really liking the health, the way that you're talking about the health coming in, the mental health coming into this picture. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's really, like I said, it's really kudos to him because I, I feel like no matter how he was going to react, I mean, I've been doing it for 25 years because right. he would, um, you know, he would get angry about something. He would not tell me what he was angry about. I was supposed to figure it out. And then when I didn't figure it out, I would get the silent treatment. And that could go on for two, three weeks sometimes where he was barely speaking to me. And I would was still at that point committed. Like, I'm going to be kind to him no matter what. I don't care how he's treating me. I'm going to get up every day and pack his lunch and make coffee and act like nothing is wrong. Right. And so I felt like I was always capable of doing that, you know, being kind, no matter what, but yeah, I had putting it back together. Mm -hmm. I really had no hope whatsoever that he would reciprocate. And he has, and we really, like I said, you know, we got divorced last December is December 22nd was the date of the divorce. And even things were better between us before the divorce happened. And he's like, are you sure you want to do this? And I'm like, no, I am because like, even if at some point in the future, we figure out a way to come back together, I need it to be a new relationship because that marriage was a disaster for me. And I cannot continue that relationship. We have to have a hard break and right. start completely over. There's like, that cannot continue. So right. he agreed to it. We got the divorce and I mean, we're getting along better now than we ever have. And partially it's because we are able to actually talk things out. Like when he's feeling anxious or stressed or whatever about a situation he just tells me and then we talk it out and vice versa and I'm like I I understand that this is how relationships are always supposed to be but this is never the relationship that we had with each other so it's very strange for me but it's I'm hopeful because we're both making the changes necessary to mm -hmm get along with each other, even mm -hmm. if it isn't that we're ultimately going to come back together as, mm -hmm. you know, a permanent couple. So, right. Right. So if, a few other things like the wake up call, like sometimes the wake up call hits people at all different times. Um, and it, it's interesting that it hit him. It also got tested his wake up call, like whether you were going to go back, did you have a wake up call too? that? Hey, you got to stick this if you're going to really make your point about this old this old marriage can never be there for me. It's a disaster for me on my self-esteem, on my um, way I think about life, on the way I feel held in relationship. So like for you, it, it was over. And I love that um, the way that you're framing that is like, even if there was now you're getting along and even if there was a future, it would have to be a whole different relationship where you're actually seen more than you were in the old marriage. Um, it's interesting, really, really interesting. Cause I always advise people not to get divorced during the holidays because it's such a stressful time. So, um, I'm like, I'm always like, no, there's, you know, holiday divorces are crisis. So I wonder, was your holiday divorce a crisis? No, I don't think so. It was, the timing was more about just the slowness of the court system because we filed for dissolution because we didn't actually get divorced it was a dissolution because we got we agreed about everything we didn't have lawyers or anything um and we filed for it in october october okay okay so the final so day it was yeah two was, months was, yeah. and more before we finally got yeah. it done right um okay well that makes sense because then there was lots and lots of changes it's a it's okay in my book to get divorced in december in october but november and december i think it's always challenging and mostly that's the filing part so you're yeah. you do that yeah okay so that makes a lot of sense yeah yeah. Uh -huh. So was, tell me about your forward motion. So, uh, you know, it's interesting also just to um, kind of get this uh, conversation to a different place is that um, hard things in life happen, you know, to all of us. And then there's the hard time. And then the hard time is like, you can see the scattered hard times in your marriage. And then after the hard time, you have to process the hard time. So the hard time that keeps going on a little bit longer because it's still in the air and then you come into another time. So what other time have you come into since then? Well, I mean, it's been a long, hard road and it really, 
really was a roller coaster over the last year, but I finally feel like we're at a place where we're like genuinely like the trauma is not as bad. Like I don't wake up in the middle of the night as, you know, distressed as I was. And he isn't either. Um, you know, he would wake up in the middle of the night and be awake for two or three hours because he was just like devastated over everything ending. And he's not anymore. And partially that's because we're getting along really well right now. And partially it's just, you know, that the time that has passed and healing starts happening and it's just, yeah, we're, we're both a lot better now. Um, and so there is something to say about like time heals, like a year's passed in that year you get through a lot of your feelings and, and then the feelings stop cycling so hard. Yeah, absolutely. And the Mm -hmm. odd thing was that in the last year, my dad passed away, his dad passed away just before everything blew up between us. So in the last year and a half, we both lost our fathers. This whole thing happened with us and, you know, it could have, it could have gotten a lot worse, but instead it's gotten better. And that's not something that I ever, ever expected before Mm -hmm before everything happened with us, um, you know, he's very emotionally, mentally, psychologically abusive, um, which was part of the narcissistic tendencies. And I couldn't talk to him about anything, anything with my business, anything with anything, because he would always point out things to break down my self-esteem. And I realized the other day, my oldest son, he's 20 and we were on the phone and he asked me a question about some business related thing because we're doing a project together. And he's like, you don't have to answer because I know dad's there and you probably don't want to talk about it. And then I was like, no, honestly, I don't know. It's okay. Like I'm fine with talking about it in front of him because I'm at a point now where before I was protecting myself all the time. And now I'm at a place where if he doesn't like it, tough luck, (laughs) number one, but number two, he is, he's not doing that anymore. Like when I'm scared about something he's being very supportive and it's almost odd and feels kind of foreign and alien to me and sometimes I'm like I appreciate how supportive you're being but I'm having a hard time believing that this is really you because of my 25 years of experience with you Mm -hmm. and he's like no this is like I'm really I want you to succeed and I'm here behind you and you know we're better together as a team helping each other than trying to do it alone. And it's, it's crazy. And I honestly can't believe that's the way things are going at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, that reminds me um, of boundaries, right? I think sometimes you were holding boundaries kind of like behind the scenes and now you're holding them like, you know, right forward, you know, like, you know, he knows where your boundaries are. So even if he did talk to you when your son is asking you questions about a project, you wouldn't, allow the same conversation to come up. Like you would be like, I'm not listening to that anymore or something like that. So it's not, or he might say, I can't do that anymore because she actually stood her ground. So there is this thing about when you start holding your own, when you start being your whole person again, I think there is more respect that steps into place than the person you were in your old relationship that was unhealthy. There is a switch of energy, right? That comes in there. Do do, Do you notice that? Absolutely. And I have to give all of the credit to Randy Buckley because uh, in one of our coaching sessions, she was like, well, it's okay if he doesn't like your boundary, like you still can have it. He doesn't have to like it. And at that point, when I would put the boundaries in place, this was prior to everything blowing up, he didn't like it and he would get very angry and he wouldn't talk to me for a while. Um, But now it's just not, it's just not happening like that. Like I just, it's so funny because that's what I was thinking about was Randy Buckley because I was just um, on a podcast with her and she and I were talking about this concept that keeps running through all my sessions with people is that boundaries are actually really respect and also boundaries are cultivated you don't have the same boundary with everybody but you have boundaries that fit you with the situation with that person and so I I love that you you were like it, it you know I had these boundaries, but I used to get punished for having the boundaries. And now you're like, well, in a way, if we're not married anymore, he really can't punish me in the same way because we're not in that sort of codependent relationship anymore. And you've switched out. So, and and Randy Buckley, right. She's the number one boundary person. That's why I talk to her regularly just to 
to hear the latest things she has to say, the latest concepts she's um, sort of labeled it in a different way. Yeah. Great. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me more about um, things that have inspired you in the present, because I know you're doing some kind of business thing with stories, with people's stories. And yeah. Mm -hmm. So part of what happened with um, us breaking up was that, you know, and it, it actually happened. The timing that I had in my head was for next year for everything to to like us to to separate and go our separate ways um he was not on board with that he did not believe that i meant that mm -hmm. um and so it happened a couple of years earlier than i planned it but i wanted all of our kids to be graduated and on their own before i did this and that is not what happened um but in the process of figuring out what i want for my life after the kids are gone um, I bought a vintage motorhome. It's, uh, was built in 1972. So it's even older than I am. Um, and I want to <laughs> fix it up and travel around in it and basically live in it is, is really my goal is that I want to live in this motorhome. And I, uh, then started talking to my son who is in the film industry about what I want to do with it. Like, I don't want to just travel around in it. I want it to be like a, a whole thing on its own is that I want to film a docu-series where I'm helping people like illuminate their stories mm -hmm. and um, be inspirational to people because I think you know so many people are just like we all go through the same things but we yeah. all feel so much shame around it like my divorce the video that you you know kicked this off with is that you know a lot of people are like why did you do this like you're just wanting attention and I'm like no what I want the attention for is not me and my story, but just the idea that we can do things differently. We don't have to have a nasty divorce just because everybody else has nasty divorces. Like we can get along with each other and figure out new ways of doing things without, right. without right. making it nasty. Right. So I'm taking these notes because I don't want um, people to miss these gems that you're saying. So I'm going to, I'm going to repeat them and just keep pulling the people towards them. So the one thing is this whole idea about narratives, like what your narrative is. So you can have a narrative about your divorce that can be very shameful and can be something that really tore you down, that makes you take a lifetime to get over, or you can have a narrative and start working your story differently so that, and, and what you're doing to inspire people is to you know, be a model of not that you're a model of like, oh, like you did this great healthy divorce, but a model of um, there's hard times that happen in life. And what do you pull out from yourself when you have a hard time? And I love this because you always have these great projects. So I love this. <laughs> uh, and if people want to know about your great projects, they should just flip back in your history or look on your website, which, I, which I'll have available because you do some really inspiring things um, with people and with yourself. So that whole idea about like, what's your dream? Okay, so the timing isn't quite right in terms of like things might've happened out of order, but you yeah. still have this dream inside you. And so why not, when you're having a hard time, pull that dream out and start doing it. And then what does the narrative of yourself, how does the narrative of yourself change if you really reach in and find this really powerful, creative, um, part of yourself that's like, I've always wanted to blah. And there's a real helpful part of you that you like to do that with other people too. You like people to find their powerful story, their powerful dream inside themselves, right? So food, vintage motorhome, son who films it. I love the way this is coming together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just every time I come up with a new part of it, I call him and he's like, he talks me through things and he's He's my little sounding board and like helps me. And he actually always, always tells me I'm not going big enough with things. Like you need to go bigger with that. Like, you know, think bigger. When I first started my podcast, it was like an idea for this. And he's like, not big enough, bigger. And I'm like, okay, all right. And this is your son that says this to you. Yeah. Yeah. He's 20 and, but he is a wise old soul. You know what I love about this is that there he was earlier in our conversation saying, don't talk about this in front of dad, right? Because, yeah. you know, dad's going to say the old stuff. And then um, you're like, no, you can do that. And then he actually pulls out and reminds you like your self-esteem has been hidden. And yeah. so you got to pull it out, mom, because I see it and I, oh, yeah. I want it out. 
and and like so he sees this really amazing part of you which i i think that's something um so amazing about you know kids and people who um actually separate in their families and if they can get on top of their own healing and on top of their shame like meaning like they don't let the shame run them that yeah. the kids actually see way more than you think yeah. they do oh, and they yeah. also also like they love their parents. Most of the time they love their parents. You're like, you know, sometimes in situations, you know, you get an estrangement going on because of stuff, but, but they love their parents and they see who they are. And so your kids never, it sounds like, I don't know if the rest of them do that, but that he never stopped seeing you through this whole yeah. growth period. Yeah. The, the good mm -hmm. thing about the kids is like, I've always, you know, we, I've been really close with all three of them. Um, and they were part of this when, when Jeremy and I broke up, like initially, um, that's one of the wake up calls for him was like, the kids all agree with me that you were abusive. Like they were there for it and they're not going to lie about it to make you feel better. Like they genuinely feel like you were abusive to me and you don't have a relationship with any of them. So like he was, I think that's one of the wake up calls for him is that he was going to be alone, like completely alone. The kids, if he was going to be nasty, the kids wouldn't have anything to do with him. And so that made him really reassess mm -hmm. like what's going on with himself. And mm -hmm. he has been able to just in the last year, cultivate a, a really good relationship with all three of them. And none of them are really like, they don't care if we stay together or split up. They just want us both to be happy. But at you know, a year ago, our daughter was barely talking to him. Our youngest son thought he was a jerk and the oldest son had all kinds of problems with him. And now they all talk to him and they all text with him and they all say, I love you. And hmm. so even regardless of everything between us, right. if it, just the idea that he can have a good relationship with all three kids makes it all worth it for me, like a hundred percent. Right. So, right. I, I mean, I think sometimes the pain that's trapped in a family once that pain gets released, people get to actually play a different position or role. Yeah. And sometimes this thing is just so, you know, gutted, you can't move it, you can't move yeah. that dynamic and everyone's affected by it. That's what it sounds like you're, yeah. they're set free because you yeah. did that. Well, one of the things that, <laughs> this is another thing that my son said to me um, that was amusing to me. And he's always like, he sees right through everything. And I was actively holding myself back because I was worried about the way, you know, Jeremy would react to my future. And Riley, he's the oldest one. He said, well, what excuses are you going to make when he's not part of it anymore? And I was oh. like, shoot, like, you're right. Like I'm holding myself back because of perceived you know, whatever. And it's not really about Jeremy at all. It's all about me and how I'm really self-sabotaging so that I don't have to show up. And oh, then I know this is so interesting. Yeah. Um, so I bought this building. I'm in the process of renovating it. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it happened during COVID. So like a lot of the things have taken infinitely longer than they should have. You know, contractors were so busy. I had to the HVAC system is in, um, the Mason has done wonders on the brick parts of my building, but the, the plumbing and the electricity, I've just been in limbo and a plumber fell into my lap that was willing to do the job for half of what the other plumbers were going to do. So I was like pouncing on it. Um, but then I realized like I have been dragging my feet and not as uh, aggressive on the project as I normally would be with a project because I'm terrified of when the building is done, I actually have to open the co-working space and I have to like start doing the business incubator for women. And what if that fails? And so if I just don't finish the building, uh -huh. then I don't have to do that. Right. And so again, with the self-sabotage, I realize, you know, I'm just like not not doing it because I'm scared and ah, got it. Okay. So I, I want to explain to people. So um, one of the things I do, and it sounds like you do similar things is I find groups of women that are working on different parts, aspects of their businesses to be inspired and to learn. Right. And so, yeah. um, so that's, I've done that for years. You've done that for years. That's where we met each other is in the inspiring group with Randy Buckley. Yeah. Um, and everyone was kind of working on their dreams 
right? And so you, one of the things that you were working on was creating a work a co-working space with women doing their amazing business ideas and, and having a space for that. And that so that's what you're talking about. So you're thinking if, okay, life can happen, like it's almost like we have this finite amount of energy. Life can happen and we can just feel like we can't push through with whatever, whatever this thing is that we want to do. And then you, um, and part of that not pushing through is like, uh, in your case, is like fear, right? That like you really, you really can hone in to like who's going to come to me to help me be the resource to the thing that I need to make this thing happen. But if you are like, oh gosh, it's too much to push through, then it just serves your narrative of, I don't really have to show up <laughs> again. Yeah. There's an excuse. Yeah. <laughs> like I couldn't, I couldn't find the plumber, yeah. right? Yeah, mm. exactly. Yeah. So I love that. So that idea is still going forward and a new idea is starting to emerge. So you're doing sort of both things at the same time and you're showing up. So on the days that you're showing up, on the best days that you're showing up, what are some of the thoughts that run through your head? Um, well, I feel it's a, it is a roller coaster because, you know, last Friday I was like, I can't do this. I'm overwhelmed. This is too much. I am doing too many things at once. And then I wake up Saturday and I'm like, I can do this. Like, what are you talking about? Of course I can do this. And, you know, I, I'm about to launch. What happened uh, between I, the, the day of the overwhelm and Saturday morning? What happened? I, I slept. Did you get a good night's sleep? Did you have a laugh? <laughs> like what happened? I just had a good night's sleep, I guess. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so you took care of yourself and then some other thoughts could come in. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. That's been, and you know, of being a mom for, you know, all these years, I put myself last. I always put myself last, but now that two are, you know, grown and gone, um, you know, they have their own lives and I only have one left who is all, he's 17. So he doesn't need me for anything. He has a job and is, you know, busy all the time. So it's freed up a lot of my time. And I find myself either, um, not taking care of myself or taking care of myself. And because I'm the only one here now. So, the days that I get up and I walk on the treadmill and do, you know, all the things that I know make me feel better, mm -hmm. I show up better. But the days where I'm like, I'm just going to sleep in and I'm not going to get up. And then when I get up and it's, I'm like, well, it's too late to get on the treadmill because it's, you know, and I make all the excuses. And then those days are the ones where I end up not feeling so great. So I'm realizing now at 46 that when I actually take care of myself, like I'm able to execute on the thing, the plans that I make. Yeah. It's so funny. It's like such a, it's such a, you know, concrete formula that's so hard to follow some days, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, as soon as you start not taking care of yourself, then the day starts turning into this overwhelming thing. And is when you take the time to take care of yourself, then you have the time to feel like you're showing up yep. so crazy how that works. <laughs> it really. <is>. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is this is really really exciting. And is there any other thing that you feel like you would like to say to people around, like going from a place of um, being in a hard situation or something that's really happened to them that's been really challenging, maybe for a long time going through a thing, to going back to their dreams? Like, is there anything that was is helpful for you to tell us that got you there a little faster, or um, something that you remind yourself of? Well, I, the only thing I can really think of is that I keep reminding myself that this, the, you know, the stuff I've been through for the last year really sucked and the whole long period of being miserable in the marriage really sucked. I wish that there had been a way to kick him into making changes prior to this and without all of the trauma that we had, but I'm at this point so grateful that things went went down the way that they did and things are so much better now than they've ever been that I guess sometimes you just have to blow your life up to <laughs> just to give it a fresh start because to continue in the patterns that you've been showing up in it's not working and you have to do something to change it right. and it can get better it can right. get better but not if you keep doing what you've been doing. It's not right. Kind of doing so you have like going back. Like, I wish it would work out. I wish I could get this to work. I wish it didn't have to go. And then you're like, it, it, it's going to blow. Yeah. And the blow up actually was like, okay, now the pieces will settle. Now I can do something else. Now I can focus in a different way. Now we can relate together a different way. So yeah. it's not, you know, even though you hated the blow up part, it was yeah. really necessary. And you still have yeah. to challenge yourself every day. Like, 
you know, keep coming out, like keep coming towards your dream, like don't yeah. hide again. Yeah, right? exactly. And it's been really helpful that he's so supportive now that I'm not afraid to talk about the things that, you know, I want to do next and the things I'm excited about, because that has been historically, I wouldn't talk to him about those things. I would, you know, talk to my friend Lisa or somebody else about the things that I wanted to do with my life, but he was never part of it because he would just tear me down and try to break my self-esteem. And it's not happening like that anymore. So yeah. I have to do have to keep reminding myself every day that he's not the person he was before and that it's safe to talk to him about these things now because he's actually being supportive and helpful. Uh -huh. Well, that's, that's really interesting too, because in a way you got to be an expert hider in your marriage. Yeah. And so no wonder why, like you have to work really hard not to hide now because yeah. you just kept sort of secrets in your marriage, because if you showed up, even in your power, your power was very threatening to him. Yeah time yes. now it's not anymore because he's not um he doesn't have any I don't know say over it I guess you could say it, it's sort of that and it's sort of him realizing that all of the things that he thought about the way I was reacting to him he was taking them all personally and now he he said you know we've been together for 27 years married 25 years and I never knew you and now I'm looking at you and I understand how you, you know, I understand now that you're just an independent person and it's not, it doesn't have to be threatening to me and it doesn't have to make me scared that you're going to, you know, leave, leave me behind. It's just, I need to like foster that and let you be yourself instead of trying to make you be somebody that you're not. And like, yeah, I didn't even there was so many weird dynamics going on with us. Yeah. I don't think either of us really realized how bad it had gotten until the blow up. Right. Right. It, it reminds me of this song I've been listening to the last few days by Alan Stone. That's like, it's called a part. And there's a line in it that says, you know, watch how you use your authority. Um, you know, you can use your authority uh, for good, you know, to uphold something, or you can use your authority to kind of break something down. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And we both grew up in a church environment. <laughs> both of our actually, we came from the same um, denomination and church. And um, it, I, it's not that I don't believe, you know, what I was raised believing or anything anymore. But I don't. We neither one of us is going to church anymore. And a lot of it is because I feel like we were both conditioned to think this is how women and men are supposed to react to each other, and it's not at all accurate. Like they train girls to grow up and be submissive wives and that boys that your wife is supposed to submit to you and you're supposed to be the leader and she shouldn't have any ideas and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So we're, we're both kind of like deprogramming from that right. and mm -hmm. finding ways to get along with each other and, you know, just interact with each other outside of that conditioning that we both grew up with. So. Right. It's, it, I find that a lot in my divorce support groups is that people um, really have to break out of the way they think about relationships, especially if they're going into new relationships where they want to be a different person or want to really heal the part of themselves that either got damaged in the relationship or the part of their personality that they want to work on so they can be healthier. They have to really think about relationships completely differently out of a traditional model like maybe i'm going to see like oh this part of this person i really like so i'm going to hang out with them around this part like even friendships like sometimes we're we stay in our friendships longer and they're not really healthy friendships for us or we stay in the friendships but we only engage with them in certain ways because that that is the healthier way to engage with that friendship you know, yeah. you know, the people that you can really count on and the people that you're like, they're, they're a good person to like talk to every once in a while, but I'm not going to like count on that person because I get disappointed or they really can't show up for me, you know, and really accepting that. And so in a way, it also, you're not, you're not putting as much on the relationship with your ex-husband as you were, as you both had on each other in the marriage. You know what I mean? There's a whole different scenario release in a way. Yeah. And, and it's actually showing up in all my relationships, like mm. people that I've known for years, if, if they're 
like, especially we went to a Bible college and I just unfriended a ton of the people that I went to college with because they're just argumentative and disturb my, the peace in my life. So I have, I am fully committed (laughs) to only things that, you know, are peaceful to me. If it's something that I constantly feel angry about or upset, gotta be go, gotta go. Can't do it anymore. Right. And, and the higher connection, like the higher level connection, you want to spend your time connecting with people who you really feel peaceful with that you feel, feel like-minded with and that kind of thing. Well, I I loved our talk today. I didn't know where it was going to go, but I really liked where it went because um, I just felt like there was a lot of nooks and crannies of, of guidance in there and, and just sparkles, you know, that you gave us. So, um, so I'm going to actually end the recording and just, and, and touch base with you a little bit longer um, outside the recording. Okay. Yeah. All right.